I now have the pleasure to introduce our second speaker, uh, who is Hannah Lau. And Hannah is, in fact, one of uh, Liz Carter's graduate students, one of the latest graduate students, um, and also apparently one of the few who actually got to share in travel to Iran with Liz. Um, but if I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But uh, if so, that has to have been a, a great treat and something I would dearly love to do as well. Um, Professor Lau's specialty uh, is animal management practices, and she has uh, engaged this uh, specialty in a, investigation in a variety of locations, including Turkey, where she first worked with Elizabeth Carter, and also in Azerbaijan, um, and using diverse methods, including uh, isotopic analysis, among others. Uh, she most recently held a, a postdoc at Koç University in Istanbul, in Turkey, and is now a lecturer at Colgate University. So if you'd please help me welcome uh, Hannah Lau. Okay. okay. Um, well, thank you so much for organizing this great event. It is a real pleasure to be able to participate it, in this. Um, so, but before I begin um, talking a little bit, so uh, this paper in conjunction with Sarah Witcher of Hansa, uh, is going to be about animal management practices at two six millennium sites in southern Anatolia, Tel Kurdu and Domus Tepe. Um, but before I begin, I just want to say a little bit about how I came to working on this, uh, to work on this material. Um, so when I was just starting graduate school, I knew I was interested in zooarchaeology, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted my project to be. And Liz recommended I work on some material from Domus Tepe for my MA because it was a sort of excavated and somewhat bounded project. After that, she said, focus on whatever you like, if you don't love the topic, you will never finish. Um, and it turns out that the topic that I loved was the six millennium material. And it was through this MA project that I got to work on this really fascinating and dynamic period supported by an advisor who totally encouraged my curiosity and really went to great lengths to make my dream project happen, especially as this morphed into a dissertation project. So she sat with me for weeks in the very steamy basement of the Marish Museum as I looked at material. And when we determined I needed to do my analyses there, uh, she took me to a stockyard and got me a comparative collection. So. Thank you, Liz, for all your support, intellectually and materially. Uh, Sarah witcher Kansa, my co-author on this paper, and I were introduced by Liz, and this has been a, another really wonderful legacy of her career in archaeology, which is building networks of colleagues who enjoy working together um, and promoting projects that extend really beyond their original incarnation. So thank you for that. Okay, so. Um, today, we are going to present zooarchaeological data from two Halaf period sites from southern Turkey, Tel Kurdu and Domuz Tepe, and discuss evidence of ancient inhabitants' animal management practices and the social implications of those practices. So for those of you unfamiliar with this period, it spans about 6100 to 5200 BCE, and it's generally viewed as a relatively static time marked by a widespread distribution of specific material culture across this really large swath of southern Anatolia and northern Mesopotamia. This distinctive material includes characteristic decorated pottery, the presence of tholos type buildings and administrative technologies like stamp seals and tokens. These typical Halaf characteristics, however, are found alongside local corpuses at all sites and even their uses differ from site to site. So for example, tholoi are ubiquitous, um, but often exist in tandem with other types of buildings and their uses may vary at some places functioning as dwellings at others, they were much smaller, perhaps only used for storage. The point we're trying to underscore here is that within this area denoted by these sort of characteristic materials, this halaf cultural sphere, there's actually a great amount of variability in social practices. And in general, scholars are quite divided on how they view social organization during this period. Some see all communities as egalitarian in nature, while others believe um, that by this period, inequalities are established and entrenched. Among views spanning the whole breadth of the spectrum, however, people are presumed to be highly mobile, even multi-sided, as suggested by Reinhard Baumbeck. And in this scheme, community members likely moved between larger focal sites, which were occupied repeatedly, perhaps continuously for generations, and other sites which reflect shorter occupations, some seasonal, some year round, but maybe only for a handful of years. So this map shows the distribution of sites across the Halaf cultural sphere. Here's Domus Tepe, and here is Tel Kurdu. These sites are of particular interest to compare for several reasons. So both Tel Kurdu and Domus Tepe are located on the relative sort of north and western fringes of the Halaf cultural sphere and occupied eco zones that are somewhat similar to each other in that they are both well watered where dry farming was quite profitable and included marshy areas in the vicinity. 
Additionally, both sites were abnormally large for six millennium sites and may have functioned as these kind of focal sites. They can be compared from a data comparability standpoint as well. Excavations at both sites yielded broad horizontal exposures of halal phases, per, um, permitting more detailed reconstruction of daily life for past inhabitants. Tel Kurdu is located in the Amuk Valley of Southern Turkey. Um, the valley is bounded in part by mountains and receives abundant rainfall and has a moderate climate relative to other nearby areas. Three waterways ran through the valley in antiquity and parts of um, the valley were covered with marshes and lakes, including the L Lake Amik, which was drained as part of sort of water ma management systems um, pretty recently, relatively recently. <laughs> Uh, the material discussed here comes from the 1999 to 2000 excavations by field directors Dr. Rana Ozbal and Foka Gerritsen and director Aslan, Dr. Aslan Yenner. So excavations broadly exposed one portion of the Halaf settlement, which comprised a dense series of building compounds separated by streets and alleys, a series of neighborhoods. The detailed study of domestic life permitted by their excavation strategy and specific attention to microarchaeological remains show that there were clear differences in practices among inhabitants of the different buildings that comprise the Tel Kurdu community. And though material culture recovered at the site show clear engagement with the Halaf cultural sphere, it's also really exhibits strongly local characteristics. So the majority of the ceramic corpus is primarily composed of local wares like own dark faced um, burnished and unburnished wares. And painted cloth ceramics are present, um, but some of them are locally produced. So, uh, faunal remains from Tel Kurdu were analyzed at various stages by myself, Belinda Moynihan, Michelle Loyette, and Frank Norduli. The faunal assemblage from Tel Kurdu is dominated by the major domesticates. Cattle comprise the largest portion of the identified assemblage at 34%. Sheep and goat, um, in aggregate, comprise about 30%. And where discernible, inhabitants seem to have had a slight preference for sheep over goat at a ratio of about 1.3 to 1. Pigs constitute about 17% of the assemblage. Wild fauna compose a significant portion of the diet for six millennium inhabitants and indicated the different ecozones that inhabitants exploited. So wetland species are abundant. Fish compose about 12% of the assemblage, among which catfish are the most abundant. Among birds, the presence of waterfowl support this, as does the analyses of shell by David Rees, um, who found that freshwater shells were the most common. Uh, turtles and tortoises comprise about 2% of the wild fauna, or sorry, of the full assemblage. Um, and among wild mammals, red deer and fallow deer, so deer, make up the largest proportion of the wild fauna. Um, both species inhabit a range of habitats, but prefer wooded areas. Gazelle are the next most abundant group, and their presence attests to ancient inhabitants' exploitation of more arid steppic zones in the, in the wider region. Okay. So at this point in this conference, you've all heard quite a bit about Domus Tepe, which is located in southeastern Turkey near the modern city of Karaman Marash. Um, and it is also sort of an another unusually large Halaf period site um, with an occupation that covered quite a lot of the mound of the 20 hectare mound, though perhaps not concurrently, and in an area in which dry farming is really productive. The faunal data here comes from the excavations led by Liz and Stuart Campbell. So this slide presents the data from domestic deposits at Domus Tepe. Um, so things like middens, floors, and were identified by Sarah Witcher Cancer. So in this assemblage, sheep and goat compose about half the assemblage with a slight preference for sheep over goats. Pigs and cattle comprise 25 and 21% respectively. Wild taxa are only a small portion of the assemblage in aggregate, comprising about 2%. Deer are the most abundant, followed by wild boar. These animals, along with fish and waterfowl, attest to the use of the marshy areas and open woodlands that once existed near the site. These are not the only faunal assemblages from Domus Tepe. As Chidem um, sort of gave us a preview of yesterday, there is an extremely robust archaeological record of feasting at the site. And the three faunal assemblages associated with feasting deposits are not included in the data I'm showing here, although um, we will show them for comparison in a later slide. So when we compare the fauna from the two sites, we see that inhabitants of both sites rely primarily on domestic animals for consumption. Inhabitants of Tel Kurdu consumed greater proportions of cattle, while those of Domus Tepe were more reliant on sheep and goats and pigs. Among sheep and goats, inhabitants of both sites appear to have had a slight preference for sheep. And while inhabitants engaged in hunting and fishing, the results of these activities comprised only a small portion of the diet among residents of Domus Tepe, and a larger portion of the diet among those at Tel Kurdu. People at both sites appear to have taken advantage of the marshy and riparian ecozones in close proximity to the settlements, consuming fish and water birds, and then also hunting in the open woodlands nearby. The smaller remains of fish and birds, however, are more likely to be lost during recovery of zooarchaeological remains during the course of excavation, 
So a sample of heavy fraction from both sites has been examined, but it's sort of not equally large samples um, from both. So let's consider only the mammalian and reptilian remains for a moment. Okay. Even when narrowing our comparison the, to only these, two, these kinds of groups, there are clear differences in the relative abundance of tax of the two sites. So inhabitants at Tel Kurdu consumed more wild fauna, and relatively more cattle. Those at Domus Tepe ate um, more sheep and goats and pigs. And raising animals, so animal husbandry systems, they take a huge amount of time and energy. And different concerns and different productive goals will determine which animals and when herders choose to call them. So let's dive a little bit into some of those demographic details. So this slide here is showing the demographic distribution um, drawn from cattle bones from both Domus Tepe on the left in the more saturated colors for each group and Tel Kurdu on the right. So essentially, um, bones, we know when certain parts of the body fuse. Um, and so we can kind of group them into these age groups of about when particular bones are fused. An animal whose bones are found fused to that point means that they lived beyond that particular category. Uh, if they're unfused, they were culled before that age. So uh, one thing that's sort of interesting here is that culling decisions and domestic deposits of the two sites are quite similar. About half of all cattle are slaughtered by 36 months of age, which is prior to their reproductive maturity, but around the time when they reach their optimal size. So if you envision wanting to grow your herd, you need a lot of female cattle who can produce more cows, um, but you only need a few males. And so those are the more likely to be called at the point at which they reach their largest weight relative to the amount of labor and resources needed to sustain them. So approximately three to four years of age. At Domus Tepe, adult cattle, um, among adult cattle, there was a greater proportion of females, which is consistent with a focus on herd security and one in which dairy production may have been an important goal. The assemblage at Tel Kurdu, unfortunately, did not yield a large enough sample uh, to reconstruct sex demographics. Demo demographic distributions of sheep and goats are similar between the two sites, although we should note that the sample from Tel Kurdu is considerably smaller than from Domus Tepe. In both cases, we see a significant proportion of animals called between sort of 18 and 30 months of age, around the time when they reach their optimum size. Um, among goats, this occurs a bit later, with a major culling happening sort of between 30 and 48 months. At Domus Tepe, a considerable portion of both male and female sheep survive to adulthood and may represent a focus not only on meat and dairy production, but perhaps a sort of non-intensive wool as well. Um, and the data from Kurdi was unfortunately too small to assess this. Finally, the demographic distribution among pigs, we again see similar patterns in the demographics. Um, so about 40% of pigs were culled in their first year of life. Pigs who only provide primary products of meat, hide, bone, viscera, and who reproduce comparatively quickly in litters are often culled within that first year. Um, but a notable portion of the population for both sites was culled between about 24 and 42 months of age. And this may reflect that inhabitants were engaged in a more sort of extensive management strategy, allowing their pigs to run feral in the nearby wetlands to feed and culling them as needed and resulting in a sort of later age distribution that is predicted by most models of pig husbandry in Southwest Asia. So to summarize, we have similar management practices at the two sites, but relatively different abundances of each taxa. Um, we don't think this comes from sort of recovery practices. A portion of the heavy fraction at Tel Kurdu, um, sort of a larger portion, excuse me, of the heavy fraction at Tel Kurdu has been analyzed and a substantial number of fish and bird remains identified. So these are the things that we'd normally think we'd be losing if this was a recovery bias. So this emphasis on cattle is most likely the result of explicit cultural choice rather than either preservation or recovery techniques. These differences in choices could be a matter of local subsistence system. Perhaps the inhabitants at Kurdu found cattle worked better within their husbandry system, which was supplemented more strongly by wetland resources like fish and turtles and with wild deer and gazelle found in the vicinity. But we wanna raise another possibility. Perhaps these differences have more to do with how different taxa were used at the two sites. And for this, we need to contextualize the Domes Tepe domestic fauna with the other faunal assemblages at the site. As we mentioned earlier, Domus Tepe has a really robust archeological record of large scale communal events. The earliest feasting assemblage comes from the Red Terrace Ditch. Um, and as you may recall, Chidem talked about some of these yesterday. So this assemblage um, comes from a deposit that was composed of a series of discrete pits in a spatially segregated portion of the site, um, an artificial terrace that was marked by a very distinct red soil. And these pits were filled with large quantities of animal bone, abundant pottery and small finds, and three large ovens were found in the vicinity. This assemblage is dominated by sheep and goat, more so than domestic deposits. 
Pigs comprise roughly a quarter of the assemblage with cattle comprising only about 10%. The death pit is the remains of a single very large feasting event. Faunal evidence from this intensive consumptive event not only include animals traditionally used for food at Domus Tepe, sheep and goat, a small number of pig remains, but also what appears to be a whole herd of prime age female cattle um, and potential evidence for the consumption of dogs and at least 35 humans butchered, cooked and presumably consumed as well. Um, because this is a paper about animal management practices, I'm only having the non-human taxa here. Finally, the Operation 3 assemblage is a large concentration of faunal remains that stem from Neolithic residents' repeated disposal of refuse from feasting in a localized area that postdates these other deposits. This assemblage has a higher proportion of cattle than domestic assemblages and a smaller proportion of pig. So what's clear from these data in comparison is that in communal events, there was a change over time in which participants and uh, what the participants consumed. So initially, the main meat served was more sheep and goats, but in later events, it transitioned to cattle as sort of the main course. It's also clear that these events occurred regularly throughout the sixth millennium occupation. There were thus always a considered component of the husbandry system among inhabitants of the site, and participants may have had um, have to come sort of, excuse me, and also for participants who may have come just to attend them. So events like these take planning, likely over the course of multiple years. This is supported by the demographic data from the cattle when compared across all contexts at Thomas Tepe. In the domestic and ditch deposits, the consumed cattle include a larger proportion of younger animals. In the death pit and in the OP3 assemblage, we may be seeing the segments of the herd that were kept to a later age, perhaps explicitly from this purpose. One thing that's interesting is that in all three feasting deposits, the majority of bones that are morphologically indicate sex come from female animals, which show that perhaps that participants made clear choices to consume these more costly and maybe more ostentatious animals in these kinds of contexts. Large scale communal events like these recorded archeologically at Domus Tepe undoubtedly had major social ramifications, both in their planning and execution. And they may have played an important role in both unifying members of the Domus Tepe community through their mutual participation, perhaps maybe inadvertently, creating space for individuals or groups to amass some kind of power, perhaps temporarily, um, perhaps something that endured beyond the event uh, though the, through the coordination and manipulation of animal resources. Communal feasts are not the only indicators of activities that involve coordination and collective action by members of the Domus Tepe community, nor of the need to manage resources. So excavations in 2002 exposed a burnt structure, um, which preserved more than 16 vessels, some quite large, um, among other remains. You see here some of these vessels. So Liz and Sir have suggested that this may have been an area of communal production, um, possibly for maybe processing dairy. And the structure also contained an area that had a sort of a locus of chipped stone working, um, where obsidian bead blanks and preforms were found, along with deptage and flint and retouched pieces. The primary indicator that inhabitants needed to account for and perhaps control the movement of resources within the community come from the glyptic evidence at Domus Tepe, which Liz has studied extensively. Uh, these types of seals, um, like the ones you see here, are found throughout six millennium sites, um, suggesting that this practice is quite widespread. Telkurdu, in contrast, does not have the same indicators of major activity being coordinated at a communal level. At present, there's no indications of commensal events that are as there are at Domus Tepe. And the architecture for the six millennium levels was entirely residential. So no communal buildings analogous to the burnt structure or even the later granaries found in the fifth millennium levels at Kurdu itself um, have been identified in the six millennium occupation. Evidence for craft production was dispersed among residential compounds and not concentrated in any sort of concentrated work areas have been identified to date. Um, so inhabitants of Tel Kurdu perhaps didn't they also did have, um, need to account for their resources in the same manner as those at Domus Tepe and contemporaneous sites. A number of uh, possible seals and ceilings were found throughout the course of excavations. And Foka Gerritsen has also proposed that the reworked pottery fragments at Kurdu may have functioned as tokens in a similar manner to those that have been proposed for ceramic and stone jetons at contemporaneous Kazane and Fistiklehuyuk. Okay. So taken together, what does this comparison of faunal data and the correlation of these other types of archeological data tell us about life in six millennium Southern Anatolia? We think that one major takeaway from these data is that the heterogeneity we see in how communities organize within and among themselves. Um, so inhabitants of Kurdu, as far as we can tell at present, were engaged in a husbandry system that seems to have been oriented towards supporting the population on a day-to-day -day basis, but without any clear earmarking of resources for communal events or to support sort of specialized activities. Animal management practices, probably like craft production, were likely organized at maybe a household level. 
At Domus Tepe, however, inhabitants seem to have taken into account the need to provision communal events and perhaps coordinate secondary product production within the system. Such type of collective action requires a different kind of social organization. The type of heterogeneity we see in social organization in comparing Sith Millennium sites that are comparable in size, occupation history, and even environment is interesting because I think it allows us to identify some of these little blips and experimentations that ultimately lead to some of the clear indications of collective coordinated action found more widespread in Southern Anatolia and Northern Mesopotamia in the succeeding Ubaid period. In the fifth millennium at Tel Kurdu, for example, Rana Ozban colleagues have identified some clear indicators of cross specialization and communal storage. This is something identified um, at many contemporaneous sites throughout the Ubaid region as well. So, such distinctly different ways people chose to organize these activities had to come from somewhere, and perhaps we're seeing these sort of antecedents and this type of experimentation we see in the sixth millennium, even if only fleetingly. So I just want to thank all the many people who made this work possible, and especially you, Liz, for putting me on this path. Thank you. <laughs>